Chapter 18 Review Be sure to go over the components of blood plasma, as well as all of the formed elements. We covered quite a few things about red blood cells. For each of the white blood cells, you should know at least one to two sentences apiece about their function. Lastly, one of the big concepts in this chapter was the formation of blood clots. This was a highly regulated mechanism. I'll have a slide coming up for that in a minute. There are eight blood types. These come from a mixture of the ABO blood group plus or minus the RH factor. Somebody who has no antigens on the surface of their blood would have type O negative blood and they would be the universal donor. They would, however, have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. Somebody with type A blood would have the A antigen on the surface of their red blood cells. They would not have anti-A antibodies. Similarly, somebody with type B blood would have the B antigen, and they would not have the anti-B antibodies. And somebody with AB blood would have both the A and the B antigen, and they would have neither the anti-A nor the anti-B antibodies. Somebody who has AB positive would also have the RH antigen on the surface of their red blood cells. The only people who make anti-RH antibodies are those who are RH negative, and they only do that after they have come into contact with the RH antigen once. This happens very rarely, but it can happen in utero. So go back and review your anti-RH antibodies and the use of ROGAM, or artificial anti-RH antibodies, that can be given to RH-negative mothers during a pregnancy. There are a number of things that can decrease the amount of oxygen reaching the kidneys, making them hypoxic. For instance, loss of red blood cells, decreased amount of oxygen in the environment, or increased aerobic activity will all lead to less oxygen reaching the kidneys. And when this happens, they produce a hormone called erythropoietin, or EPO. This travels throughout the body, and when it reaches the bone marrow, it will activate stem cells, the mesenchymal stem cells, to differentiate into red blood cells, increasing the oxygen-carrying capacity of the blood. If somebody has moved to Colorado, where the air is thinner, they would have an elevated number of red blood cells after a month or two. If they were to move back down to sea level, the oxygen carrying capacity of their blood would be in excess of what they need. Another type of hormone, called the colony stimulating factors, also works on the bone marrow, but these hormones drive the differentiation of those mesenchymal stem cells into white blood cells. There are a number of different colony stimulating factors that can drive the production of different types of white blood cells. Blood vessels are lined by endothelial cells. Superficial to that, an artery or a vein would have a layer of smooth muscle, and then superficial to that would be connective tissue, including collagen fibers. When a blood vessel suffers damage, it will first go through the vascular phase of hemostasis, meaning it will vasoconstrict. This both narrows the diameter of the blood vessel as well as causing it to retract. Next up is the platelet phase. Because endothelial cells have been damaged, platelets can now come into contact with collagen. This will make the platelets sticky, which cause them to stick to more platelets which become sticky and stick to more platelets, forming a platelet plug. This plug is not very strong. These platelets, though, will release intrinsic factor, in meaning the platelets came from inside the blood, and the damaged endothelial cells would release extrinsic factor, X meaning the endothelial cells are outside of the blood. These factors would then activate the coagulation cascade, which ultimately leads to the activation of thrombin, 
which in turn converts fibrinogen into the insoluble protein fibrin. Fibrin contract blood cells, sealing up the cut. If any activated thrombin gets washed downstream, it will be inactivated by anticoagulants, including heparin. The only reason coagulation can occur at the site of injury is that the coagulants, thrombin, eventually outnumber the anticoagulants, heparin. You may have already used heparin as a blood thinner. Because it blocks the production of fibrin, which is a solid, it tends to keep the blood in a more liquid form. Hence, this can help to lower blood pressure. If you've ever seen blood clotting in the emergency room or on the operating table, you have seen blood that has run out of heparin. Every once in a while, thrombin may accidentally get activated when it is not needed. As long as heparin is there to inactivate it, the blood will not clot. And in circulating blood, you should never run out. But blood droplets on the floor, eventually the amount of heparin will run out and that blood will begin to clot. Lastly, the blood clot is not needed forever. After the healing process has begun, the clot must be removed. Activation of plasmin will ultimately lead to the destruction of the blood clot. This makes plasmin a fibrinolytic, capable of removing unwanted blood clots. If you've ever administered TPA, you have activated plasmin in a patient to try and remove some of their unwanted blood clots.